This is America's secret jewel, a wilderness so rare it ranks among the most diverse places on the earth. Its rivers and creeks are home to more species of aquatic creatures than any comparable area in the world. Its forests boast more kinds of plants than any in North America. It's not in Yellowstone or Yosemite. It's in the last place you'd expect it to be, the heart of the American South, Alabama. Welcome to America's Amazon. Scientists have only begun to peer into the wonders of this place, realizing that the richest, most diverse ecosystems in the country sit right here. But they are also among the most threatened and least protected. Every day, a little more is lost. Every year, a few more species go extinct. It's not too late to save the best parts, but time is running out. Part of the reason it's so difficult to believe the wealth of life here is because when people think of Alabama, they don't think of nature. They think of cotton fields and civil rights protests. Not of what this place is, but what we've done to it. But beyond the cow pastures and steel mills, in spite of all we've done to it, another world exists in Alabama. A wild world almost no one realizes is here. I'm Ben Raines. I've been exploring and writing about the Mobile Tensaw Delta for 14 years. I've come to know this amazing hidden world intimately, including all the ways we're harming it. This is the story of an ancient place colliding with the pressures of our modern world and of the connections between the plants, the animals, the water, and us. We've changed the delta and its rivers in ways large and small. To reverse that damage, we have to understand this place. That begins with the water. If you look at a map of Alabama, the first thing you see is water. The state is defined by its biggest rivers, the Alabama, the Tom Bigby, the Coosa, the Tallapoosa. Alabama has more miles of rivers and creeks than any other state, 77,000 miles of them. Two-thirds of those rivers funnel together into the Mobile Basin, creating the vast Mobile Tensaw Delta. The giant river delta in Mobile Bay make up one of the largest and healthiest estuaries left in the United States. Taken together, it makes for the most diverse ecosystem outside of the tropics. The heart of the system begins at the top of Mobile Bay with thousands of acres of saltwater coastal marshes. Further up in the delta, the freshwater cypress swamps take over as dozens of rivers, creeks, and bayous braid together and twist apart. Farther north come floodplain forests dominated by gum trees and tupelos. As the country becomes more hilly, the forests switch to hardwoods, and throughout its length, the whole system is surrounded and fed by tens of thousands of tiny creeks flowing in from the edges, rich with life. It is arguably the biologically richest place, the delta, floodplain forest or swamp, and the area immediately around it, including the Red Hills to the north, where we are seated here, uh, has more species of plants and animals than any comparable area anywhere in North America, United States and Canada. Let me just tick it off. We have as many or more kinds of salamanders as any place in the world. Alabama has the largest number of fish species 
of any state, 350. We have one of the richest forests in terms of numbers of species. We have a variety of other predator or predatory animal species. And here is a clincher as far as I'm concerned. This area has the largest number of turtle species of any place in the world. It's only gradually that we've come to learn what a treasure this delta is. The ecosystem has been in the making for millions of years. The key ingredients behind its diversity can be boiled down to two things, geography and ice. The vast sheet of ice that covered most of North America during the last ice age petered out before it reached Alabama, leaving the state's forests and rivers unfrozen, untouched. With glaciers a mile thick or freezing temperatures reaching across most of the country, Alabama's hills and valleys remain warm and hospitable. When plant and animal life from the Arctic south to Tennessee fell victim to the big chill, eons worth of evolutionary change on the continent were wiped away in one fell swoop, except in Alabama. This is where evolution had time to happen and where it survived. These sheltered hollows with their creeks and forests became the refuge for life east of the Mississippi River. In fact, Almost every plant you find in eastern North America lives in Alabama. This was the place they spread away from after the Ice Age, slowly repopulating the continent with plant life as the glaciers retreated. Oh, this is an amazing place. This is the kind of place where you would find things left over from before the glaciers came down into the, and changed the climate in the area. So the glaciers never got here, but they changed the climate so much that many things just disappeared either got too dry or too cold. So these sheltered ravines could have unbelievable things hiding away in them. And anywhere where you find a salamander that's in its own genus, there's got to be something else. So I think there's a pretty good patch over here. J.J. Apodaca studies one of Alabama's living fossils, the endangered Red Hill salamander. One of the last new salamanders discovered in the U.S., this species is ancient and so rare it has survived in just one spot on Earth, this narrow band of rocky forest bluffs. The soft limestone bluffs are the only place the salamanders can carve the tiny caves where they spend their entire lives. JJ uses tiny hooks and bits of cricket to coax them from their holes, the only way he can catch the reclusive creatures for study. Our best estimates are that they're about 40 to 50 million years old. Most salamander species are anywhere from 2 to 10 million years, diverge from their closest ancestor. Um, we're sitting in the Red Hills, which is the southernmost extent of what used to be the first version of the Appalachian Mountains. So they probably evolved right here, specialized to this habitat type, and, and have just never spread. It's so diverged from its closest ancestor that it was put in its own genus, like a platypus. It has no really closely living relatives. Though the area was stable in terms of temperature, change still came. America's Amazon was deeply affected by another force of nature, the ocean. Over the eons, sea level changed, not just by a few feet, but by hundreds of feet at a time. Forests were submerged, new beaches were created. For proof, look no further than the ancient hints, relics from the past, scattered about the landscape. So we can see evidence of the geologic change here, 90 miles inland, north of the Gulf of Mexico, in these cliff faces along the Alabama River, we've got sand dollars, sea creatures, spilling out all over the place. 35 million years ago, this spot was the Gulf of Mexico. Now. It's freshwater river. Through it all, dinosaurs, glaciers, mass extinctions, this vast swamp has always surrounded the place where these rivers met the sea. The gulf was also once far smaller than it is today. 10 miles from the nearest land, 60 feet underwater, lies an ancient forest. 
The stumps of thousands of cypress trees sprout from the seafloor, carpeted with sea anemones. This was the Mobile Delta, back 50,000 years ago. It wasn't just escaping the big freeze that made Alabama so diverse. The other key was the incredible variety of habitats, from rocky mountains and grass prairies to coastal marshes and beaches. The thread tying all the habitats together was water. The headwaters of the Delta Rivers begin high in the foothills of the Appalachian Mountains, 300 miles to the north. Mountain streams tumble around granite outcroppings and cascade over waterfalls as they begin their journey to the sea. As the rivers move through the Black Belt region in the middle of the state, they slow down and spread out. The waters here are rich and warm, surrounded by oak and hickory trees. This was the land of plantations and steamboats. Falling down into the coastal plain, the rivers come together in a broad, shallow valley, a classic river delta, just like the Nile or the Amazon. Our delta, the Mobile Tensaw Delta, is the third largest in the United States. Cypress trees, alligators, and brawling river currents. The delta is where the fresh water draining out of three states meets salt water from the Gulf of Mexico. The tidal currents from the Gulf carry salt water and saltwater creatures up to 100 miles inland in the delta. Like the Amazon, the system is ruled by nature's clock. In the early spring, the rivers swell under a steady deluge of seasonal rains. The rains come and come and come. In fact, South Alabama is one of the wettest spots in North America, subjected to an annual rainy season just like you see in the tropics. For four months every year, a huge portion of the delta disappears under the rising water. The creeks that feed it swell with spring runoff, transforming into rushing torrents. And hundreds of thousands of acres of floodplain forest are submerged. The water slipping through these trees is about five feet deep. Right now we've got fish and turtles swimming around here, but come summertime this will be dry ground. Pigs and squirrels, birds flapping all around. It's an amazing transformation every year, and it's what feeds these forests. This is just a huge shot of fertilizer that pumps nutrients in here every year, just like the Amazon or the Nile. Despite every attempt to tame it, the delta remains a place beyond our control because of the flooding. The annual flooding means it is a world ruled by water, and all life in the delta, even man, has to bend to the ruler's will. As spring unfolds, the swamps blossom, wildflowers hang over the water's edge, and the fragrance of water lilies floats on the breeze. Thousands of acres of wild rice come into flower. Even the earliest visitors to the Delta realized they were in a rare world one full of creatures and plants never seen before. When English naturalist Henry Goss journeyed up these rivers in the spring of 1855, he described riverbanks clothed with tall forests to the water's edge, trees arrayed in all shades of green, of various height and form, some covered with glorious flowers, suddenly appeared and as swiftly vanished, a constantly shifting panorama. Beautiful flowers of varied colors and fragrant perfume throng the edges of the forest. The opening of the spring is the most interesting season of the year when all nature springs into fresh existence. The Gate of Eden is, as it were, reopened and birds, insects and flowers renew their creator's praise. Spring comes in a hurry here arriving at the tail end of February. Birds and fish sport breeding plumage, and flowers begin bursting forth. Babies are everywhere you look. The spring floods also reawaken life in the saltier portion of the estuary, from tiny shrimp and fish larvae smaller than a grain of rice to gangly seagull and pelican babies. This is the hatching time, the nursery in bloom one of the most explosive periods of growth to be found in the natural world. Warm by the spring sun, 
algae and plankton in the water flourish, marsh grasses emerge, and the estuary food chain begins. The eggs and larvae of almost everything that lives in the Gulf of Mexico, crabs, shrimp, and fish, are swept into the estuary by currents, hatching at precisely the right time to graze on the sudden bounty. And then everything else feeds on them. Hidden away in the quiet backwaters, the American lotus rises up from the mud in June, and the alligator begins its reign as ruler of the delta. Warmed by water temperatures approaching 90 degrees, the big lizards prowl the creeks and wetlands in the thousands. Once nearly wiped out by DDT and overhunting, they are now so numerous, few delta visitors are willing to take a dip in any of the rivers. I would not recommend swimming here. I am deathly afraid of alligators. Yeah, look at them right there. And then there are the brave ones who hunt gators at night. They allow alligator hunting two weekends a year in the Delta. Get him? Yep. Yeah. yeah. That's a big gator. Every year, dozens of six and seven hundred pound gators are brought to the scales. About six years ago, Scientists discovered manatees showing up in Mobile Bay in the Delta with more and more regularity. Now, manatees are vegetarians, so they like to feed on plants, and especially plants that grow underwater. So here in the Delta, with the, with the mix of, of shallow flats and, and deeper areas, there's quite a variety of, of submerged aquatic vegetation that grows here. This, is, this area is kind of a manatee salad buffet, if you will. As summer moves along, Thousands of acres of underwater seagrass meadows in the lower delta are transformed into a vast nursery for sea creatures, great and small. The contribution to the entire fisheries of the Gulf is totally dependent on those, the flow of nutrients through the Mobile Tensaw Delta into the bay. Thanks to its role as a nursery, scientists describe Mobile Bay and the portion of the Gulf around it as the Fertile Crescent. It is considered the richest, most productive section of the Gulf of Mexico. As summer fades to fall and the days get shorter, the sky above the delta fills with birds. The delta becomes a migration superhighway with tens of millions of birds passing through on their way to South America. Known as the Dauphin Island Transmigration Thruway, the fields and forests surrounding the delta provide the last chance to fuel up before making the treacherous 24-hour flight across the open ocean. As bird habitat, the delta is unrivaled. Meadows of wild rice, blackberries, hundreds of species of plants producing seeds and fruit, and thousands of species of insects. Bob Sargent has been catching and banding migrating birds on the edge of the delta for 20 years. By his count, hundreds of species flood through the delta each spring and fall. We think that these birds actually stage north of the delta, just north of the delta, maybe some in the delta. And the reason is, it's probably a great place to fatten up. In other words, they can top off their fuel tanks. The way this migration works with these birds, the, they will stuff their gut with as much food as they can, but they're able to fly nonstop across the Gulf, or in some cases the Atlantic, simply because they, they put on fat. While most of the birds push across the Gulf to Central America, some end their migration right here. White pelicans, which spend the warmer parts of the year in northern latitudes, show up in the delta by the hundreds. For now, the delta is in its quiet season. Animals are either hunkered down against the cold north wind, or they've pushed on to warmer climates, waiting to return when spring starts up again. The Delta Rivers, the Tom Bigby, the Alabama, the Mobile, and the Tensaw are the heart of a watershed that drains 44,000 square miles. But the most magical spots lie on its outer edges, along the tens of thousands of creeks that feed into the big rivers. Those creeks and the forests surrounding them are home to more species of plants and animals than almost any other ecosystem on the planet. Most people have no idea of how little explored a system like this is, and what great yield for human welfare, for benefit, um, that it will yield, even if you don't like nature that much, this is what makes this a treasure. 
The thing that really sets the Mobile River system apart from everywhere else is the aquatic world. Simply put, Alabama has more species of aquatic creatures than any other state, more species than any other area its size in the world. The state has 348 species of freshwater fish, some so rare they live only in a single creek. Others, like these rainbow shiners, are spread far and wide. Alight with their spawning colors, the fish shimmer in the water like turquoise jewels. With all the water in the state, everywhere you look, there are crawfish. Little bitty guys like this rusty grave digger, one of the rarest species in the state. We're down here in a swamp, sandwiched in between a shopping mall, the interstate, and a sewage treatment plant. It's one of the only places in the world you could catch one of these, a rusty grave digger crawfish. They thought they had all gone extinct until I caught one a few years ago, and that's the first one anybody had seen in 25 years. And they thought they'd all died out just because of all the development surrounding this swamp. And really, that's the fate of all the rare plants and animals in Alabama. We're squeezing them all out, destroying the only places they can live. Surrounding and feeding the creeks are the Delta's rarest and most threatened ecosystems, the pitcher plant bogs. The carnivorous plants in the bogs turn the table on the animal world by actually consuming living creatures. The plants, butterworts and bladderworts, sundews and frogs breeches, have evolved various seductions to earn their prey. Tricks of light, tricks of scent, or just by being plain sticky. One of the great centers for carnivorous diversity in the world is sitting right here on the edges of the delta. Incredible. There are, in Alabama, there are nine species of pitcher plants alone. That is the world's, as far as I know, that is the world's greatest concentration of pitcher plants anywhere. But it's not just the pitcher plants that make Baldwin County stand out. Working in a bog there, scientists counted 63 species of flowering plants in a square meter of ground, making it one of the most diverse places ever measured on Earth. Seen from the edges, the delta is seductive. Its beauty draws you in, but journeying into the inner reaches is difficult. There are a handful of tour operations that carry people into the delta, but to most, it remains a place of mystery and danger. For those who make the trip, the swamps and forests of the delta seem to cast an infectious spell. Pat Ogburn is obsessed with finding the Great Swamp's last secrets. Well, uh, you know, getting here is at least half the fun, and maybe more than that. You know, when you get here, it's nice to catch some fish, but uh, the trip in and the trip out are worth the whole day's trip. He bought a specially outfitted boat to carry him deep into the innermost reaches, places he calls the Hidden Lakes. So remote, few have ever seen them. I have a goal of trying to get in just about every one of these lakes. I don't know how many I've done, but I've done more than I haven't done. Uh, but I got a few favorites and I keep coming back. This is one of my favorites. His hidden lakes are scattered all over the delta, remnants of old river channels. They feel as if they've been forgotten by time. I just like being here. You know, it's very, very pretty. It's, uh, as I said, the trip in and the trip out of a good bit of the fun, and the fishing's wonderful. The wildlife is so abundant. Uh, alligators and all different kind of birds, snapping turtles. Uh, we catch a lot of catfish. We fly fish for brim and bass. And, uh, you know, it's just a really neat outing, and it's a very, very special place. And there's not many places like this in the world. The best way to enjoy it is to go out and be part of it for a while. Sylvester Hooks, known as Boo Boo, has spent his entire life in these waters doing everything from hunting hogs to gigging frogs. These days, he feels compelled to bring kids up into the Delta and share some of his world. At a time when I couldn't provide for myself, I came out on the Delta and learned how to fish, learned how to hunt, and it provided a living for me. And, and as for the younger generation to come, uh, I would like to put some of this, my knowledge into the younger generation, uh, things that I've learned over this Delta. You know, like I said, this, this is, it is my life. Maybe we'll go to the Glasses Blind Ditch. Russell Ladd's family has been hunting Only and fishing in the Delta since before World War II. 
time spent on its creeks and bayous connects the generations. This has been, this has been a godsend. This is where I raised three sons. I was raised up here. My daddy raised me up here. But one of the favorite things we did was anchor at the mouth of Chukfee, take the crab lines, drop them. This was in the fall, of course. Now, and you know the salt water and the crabs were up here. We'd put the lines over like you, the old timey way to catch crabs. We'd catch the crabs, put them in a pot and boil them, sit there on the back of the boat, eating crabs and watching football. Some have earned their livings from its waters since they were born. For them, their love affair with the Delta is a lifelong romance. My father raised me on it. I raised my family on it. My family has raised theirs on it. And if you don't love that, there's something wrong with you. That's all I can say. Larry and Barry Scott pull shrimp from the Delta for their bait shop, Scott's Landing, just like their father did. We were fishing uh, you know, from time we were, were real small. My, my, our grandfather had a, had a seafood market in Mobile, and my, my father uh, shrimp and fish for him when he was growing up. And like I say, by the time we were four, five, six years old, Daddy had us in a boat. You know, a lot of people would die to have our sunsets every afternoon overlooking Mobile, and the same thing with sunrises, you know, when we're out in the bay shrimping, it's, it doesn't get much better. Catfishing is hard work. Robert Dean has been working the river since he was a boy. He fishes for catfish to supply his restaurant, Dixie Landing Cafe. His box traps are usually filled with fish, but not today. Yeah, they're not, they're not through spawning. You could bait them up with the best kind of bait they would not, they won't go in them when they spawn him. They just like me and you, when they courting, that's all they want to do. They just want to court. <laughs> Once the spawn is over, Dean says the boxes will start filling up again and people will be lining up to eat his catfish. Yeah, you never know what you're gonna hook on to. I think the biggest one, and there's a picture in the cafe of one catfish that weighed 120 pounds. Shaw Turner caught him way back when they used to fish lines years ago. This river is a beautiful place, the Alabama River. Not only is there a lot of history here, but I've oftentimes want, wondered what it looked like before the white man came, when the Indi only the Indians lived here. I would love to have seen it. For eons, the swamps, bogs, and rivers have held a bounty unseen anywhere else. That bounty has attracted people to the Delta for millennia. A thousand years ago, right in the heart of the Delta, on an island surrounded by a dozen twisting and turning river channels, was the capital of a mound-dwelling civilization that stretched all along the northern Gulf Coast, from Louisiana to Florida. Archaeologists say the Mississippian culture reached its zenith on this island. The people survived off the Delta's bounty for thousands of years, living in harmony with the natural system. And then we came along. For a time, hunters and trappers ruled Alabama's rivers. Then came farming in the era of the plantations and steamboats. But it's in the last hundred years that we've truly reworked the Delta, bending it to our will. We've throttled it with dams. We've cut the ancient connections between the freshwater rivers and the salty sea, altering the natural world's calendar. We've crowded its banks with cities. We've choked the waters with runoff from our streets, golf courses, farms, the yards and our subdivisions. We've poisoned it with some of the most toxic chemicals known to man. As our population has grown, so has our impact on the Delta. Those who have known the Delta the longest say it is hurting and they say it's our fault. Man's first major impact was logging. We literally stripped the Delta. Everybody in this part of the country took their living either directly or indirectly from, the, from what we call the swamp. My father was one of those, he was a logging man. When Robert Leslie Smith was a child, Crews swarmed across the area, felling the ancient cypress and longleaf pines like swarms of locusts. As they worked, they cut new channels to float the logs out and trampled rare ecosystems. Yeah. 
trees are still big business in Alabama. In fact, timber is Alabama's second biggest industry, bringing in about 13 billion annually. Roughly 23 million acres are dedicated to growing timber in the state. Only Oregon and Georgia have more land devoted to growing trees for lumber and paper products. The way the timberlands are managed, especially the way the trees are cut, can have a huge impact on the delta. Done poorly, timber operations can both damage and alter the remaining habitat. The economics of the timber business mean forests are usually clear-cut. This lone oak was left standing in a vast moonscape that was a forest just days before. Clear cuts like this cause soil erosion and can have a devastating impact on the creeks and rivers that flow nearby. Visit a recent clear cut on a rainy day and you'll likely see mud flow into the water headed for the Delta and Mobile Bay. Forests serve as a protective buffer and filter for creeks or rivers running through them. Today, you can see the scars of clear cuts done in the last 20 years all across the Delta. It looks like someone made passes with a giant lawnmower. Old Alabama was a land of giant trees. The longleaf forests stretched across the state, big open park-like forests where fire burned back the underbrush regularly. And the trees, the longleaf and the cypress, those trees were big. Hidden away in this swamp is the last giant cypress left in the delta. Imagine a forest of trees like this, trees so big you almost can't believe them. This tree is probably 300 years old, and the only reason it's still here, the only reason it didn't get cut down, is because it's hollow. That's what this place used to be. This tree, that's old Alabama. As we knocked down the ancient forest, we began changing the landscape in other, even more profound ways. Alabama is the leader in aquatic diversity but it's also the leader in another category, the extinction of aquatic species. Alabama has lost more creatures to extinction than any other state. The biggest culprits are the dams installed on the state's largest rivers beginning in 1920. The damming of the Coosa River alone is believed to have caused more aquatic extinctions than any other factor in the history of the United States. When the eight dams on the river were installed, 40 species slipped into extinction. Mussels, snails, small fish, crayfish, whole races gone, wiped out. Most were lost when the dams flooded thousands of small creeks, springs, mountain hollows, and waterfalls. But these lakes and their dams, scattered along each of the state's biggest rivers, have caused an injury much worse than submerging beautiful places. They have destroyed an ancient connection between the mountains and the sea. For tens of thousands of years, Alabama's rivers were home to some of the world's great aquatic migrations. Where the Pacific and Atlantic coasts hosted annual migrations by a few salmon species, Alabama's rivers coursed with wave after wave of moon eyes, stripers, red horse suckers, needlefish, shad, herring, and mullet. And then there were the prehistoric giants, the paddlefish with gaping, bucket-sized mouths, and sturgeon weighing hundreds of pounds. Right here on the Cahaba River in 1945, a couple of country boys pulled a giant out of the water. People who were there still remember it. A friend of mine and me was fishing with poles down on Cahaba River. And we out in the middle of the river, this thing raised up with all them ridges on its back. We threw our pole down and run and told everybody, but nobody would believe us. But later, we saw the fish again, <laughs> the big sturgeon. It got up above the shoals and the river went down and it was caught between the shoals. So that's the way we, we found it. We carried it up to Centerville and they hung it up on a pole and took pictures of it. People come from everywhere to see it. Very historic for a small town. Made this small town put on the map. <laughs> These ancient creatures, as old as the dinosaurs, would return to their birth rivers year after year to spawn, at least until the dams were built. In spawning time, when you'd see hundreds and hundreds of sturgeon just butting that lock, trying to get further up, further up, the whole head would be bloody. 
you know what was happening. They can't get where they want to go to lay. They, didn't, they ain't no sturgeon here no more. They ain't going to be. They not, they'll never be no more. The state even had its own species, the Alabama sturgeon. It's believed the last one on Earth died last year. The fish are still trying to answer that ancestral urge to go upstream to spawn. And some of them make it, slipping through with barges moving upriver through a system of locks at each dam. Each year, some mullet make it 285 miles inland to the Cahaba, but their numbers are measured by the handful, not by the millions of pounds, the way they were just 50 years ago. Many times these fish come back to their natal streams to spawn. Now it's not only the sturgeon that do this. Many, uh, several shad species, the skipjack, the Alabama shad, would mount these large runs up the river, and, 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 but they have to have fresh water in order to spawn. That's their life cycle. And uh, it's one of the more interesting aspects of, of coastal biology, but it's also why these fishes are rather rare and, and, and imperiled at the moment, because their, their, uh, their native spawning runs have been uh, uh, fractured through our use of the rivers. In an effort to restore the ancient energy connection between the rivers and the sea, scientists have begun a program of trying to help fish move past the dams. Each morning and evening, the locks on the rivers are open briefly to allow any fish trying to make the migration journey to pass on through. But now, even that program is threatened by budget cuts. Out west, the federal government spends millions a year to help a couple species of salmon get past dams. In Alabama, two dozen species are slowly disappearing thanks to the same problems. Working on the front lines in the fight against extinction, these scientists are reintroducing rare mussels to a stream that had lost its native population. These hatchery-raised orange nacre muckets may represent the best hope for saving this particular species from extinction. More than 40 species have already been lost. That's what drives Paul Johnson. He's on a quest to save the warty backs and heel splitters, the blossom, his dream is to create new, self-sustaining populations in as many locations as possible. Mussels are filters for our freshwater ecosystems. In our rivers and streams, historically, we had these enormous densities of mussels all over the state. And each one of those the animals that you saw is, are capable of filtering a gallon or two an hour. So when you had densities in literally the thousands to the millions of animals all over the state, uh, they literally were the most important ecological component of our rivers historically. Even as the dams push species after species over the brink, another threat is taking a similar toll. Plain old mud. Lots and lots of mud. It comes from all over. Every time we disturb the soil and leave bare dirt exposed, be it a farm, a clear cut, a subdivision, we're making it a little harder for this place to survive. Mud is probably the most lethal thing we dump in our waters. It washes into our streams with every rainfall, and then it moves downstream, building up in big smothering banks, choking out the light, smothering the mussels and the salamanders, when the Skylab space station passed over Mobile Bay and made photographs in the 1970s, the one detail that really stood out was a huge giant plume of red mud that could be seen flooding into the bay and sweeping all the way down to the Gulf of Mexico. Since those pictures were taken 40 years ago, Mobile Bay has lost more than half of its seagrass beds. The once clear bay is now choked with silty mud flowing in from the delta. Sunlight can't reach the bottom. Two weeks of muddy water is enough to start wiping out the undersea meadows. We've had 40 years. That mud is smothering the little country creeks, the swamps, the grass beds. It's smothering the cradle of American diversity. Years and years ago, you can talk to some of the older people here and they'll tell you that um, Fairhope had grass beds. Grand Bay had grass beds all the way up the eastern shore to Spanish Fork. Those grass beds no longer exist today. They're not, they're not there because of pollution directly, they're there because of sedimentation. So the uncontrolled growth along the banks of the rivers where you don't control sediment 
uh, from washing off, that ends up in the system and adds to the load of, of, the, of the estuary. There are laws on the books designed to prevent mud from burying wetlands and flooding into creeks, laws to control logging, cut pollution. The problem is those laws must be enforced. The legacy of environmental protection in Alabama is atrocious. We have more extinctions than any other state. We rank 49th in the nation in what we spend to protect our environment. That's not good enough. Especially in a state that is home to one of the richest and most diverse biological communities in the nation. The George Crozier, a leading a voice among coastal scientists, believes the state's shortcomings are obvious. They are not funded at nearly the level that they have to be funded to properly manage these complex situations, you know. So I think, with, in other words, with inadequate brain power, inadequate funding, and horribly complex environment, well, management environments to deal with, it's, it's easy to understand the failures. Those failures translate into pollution. The state allows more pollution to flow into creeks and rivers from factories than any of the surrounding states. Where most states set pollution standards in terms of what flows out of the waste pipe leaving a factory, Alabama allows a mixing zone in its rivers, effectively turning the state's wild places into a giant treatment plant for industrial waste. You can barely stand to be downwind of the outfall from this paper mill. The pipe comes out of the factory and a series of six underwater spouts spew millions of gallons into the river, forcing the Alabama River to absorb the pollution. The head of the state's environmental agency declined to be interviewed on camera. These factories, both perched on the edge of the Tom Bigby River's floodplain, have been on the National Superfund list for 35 years. The river and swamp surrounding them is one of the most contaminated wild places in America. An EPA cleanup here removed the poisons from just 15 acres of this 300-acre swamp. Left behind after the so-called cleanup are acres of swamp mud containing some of the highest levels of DDT and mercury to be found anywhere in the United States. A bass caught in this swamp had one of the highest levels of mercury ever recorded in a living creature. Every year when high water comes, the whole place is flooded, spreading the pollution. Where does all that pollution go? It's pumped day and night into the heart of one of the largest wildernesses left in the United States. We can trace its invisible trail through the creatures forced to live with it. Hundreds of osprey live in the lower delta, the catch basin for all of Alabama's wastes. But they may not for long. Federal scientists say something is wrong with the osprey population. Their babies are not surviving. 20 miles away, osprey pairs nesting in other watersheds produce an average of three babies a year. In the delta, the average is less than one per year. These pelicans nesting on Galliard Island in the middle of Mobile Bay represent an amazing comeback from the brink of extinction. There are about 12,000 nesting pairs here each year. But federal testing in the 1990s showed they still had DDT levels in their flesh just below the threshold where egg failure occurs. Oysters in Mobile Bay had the highest levels of DDT seen on the Gulf Coast, according to federal testing from the 1990s. Low levels of the chemicals have worked their way into the ecosystem, showing up in fish, shellfish, and birds. But hope remains. Despite all we've done to the system, all we dump into it, it remains an incredible, robust world. In some measure, there's simply too much water coursing through it for us to poison its inner reaches. That old saying, dilution is the solution to pollution, is being put to the test here. Two things happen in, in our system. One, the volume of water coming down is so great that it flushes down the system rapidly. The bay itself empties in 48 to 72 hours, which means that the contaminants that are in the water do not have a residual time in the bay to have a large or major effect on the quality of the organisms that are living there. And, and that's very important. That's what makes Mobile Bay totally different than the Chesapeake. The annual flooding, the hurricanes, and the tropical storms that visit this region almost every year have a wonderful purging effect, often grabbing up years worth of contaminated sediments and swirling them out to sea. 
but some impacts are not so easy to wash away. The estuary has lost more than 80% of its oysters since 1910. Just like the mussels in the rivers, oysters are the marine ecosystem's filters, feeding on algae and detritus and spitting out clean, clear water. But the bay's once mighty reefs have been decimated. Part of the blame goes to our insatiable appetite. Fried, stewed, baked, best of all, raw. Oysters were harvested from Mobile Bay 365 days a year for more than a century. Today, a few thousand acres of reefs persist. After more than 100 years of uncontrolled harvest, oystermen are allowed to work for just a few weeks a year. In the wake of the BP oil spill, an ambitious plan was hatched by environmental groups to build 100 miles of new oyster reefs and 1,000 acres of marsh in a ring around Mobile Bay. We're replacing and building habitat for fish and shellfish and all the other creatures that feed off those fish and shellfish. This is a public beach. This is a public resource. So we're engaging the public to protect their resources. It's going to make this community more resilient. We need the oysters just as much as they need us. We need them to filter the 50 gallons a day that one adult oyster can filter. We need them to grow into three-dimensional reefs to provide additional habitat for crabs and shrimp and fish and all those commercially important species that we depend on in our way of life in Mobile. It won't come anywhere near replacing the oyster reefs that have been lost. But after a century of decline, it's a step in the right direction. But the human population living in the watershed is growing. We can't depend on nature to continue to swallow our rough treatment. Alabama's rare treasures have survived this long, partly because they seldom came into contact with man. But that's changing. A list of estuaries near the nation's largest cities provides all the insight one needs, from the starved and channelized river deltas in California to the dying Chesapeake Bay system. And Chesapeake Bay has been a disaster for 50 years because there are 15 million people that live in the watershed of Chesapeake Bay. You know, and, and we don't have a third of that in the Mobile Bay watershed, at, but it's changing and it's growing and that, that the population is going to have its impact unless we can educate them to improve and lessen their individual impact. I hate to sound like an environmentalist, you know, but think globally, act locally. And that's probably what we're faced with in some ways here. The signs we're heading off that same cliff are all around us. Look for the Jubilee. On warm, still summer nights, the shores of Mobile Bay sometimes become crowded with sea life. Shrimp, crabs, flounder, stingrays gather together at the water's edge, jockeying each other out of the way as they try to get as close to the beach as possible. For decades, locals have treated the phenomenon as a natural windfall, an opportunity to scoop up shrimp, crabs, and fish by the bucketful, hence the name Jubilee. But the Jubilee is actually a warning siren, not a call for celebration. I see these mullet here, which you very, I've never seen mullet in a Jubilee. I've never seen fish die in a Jubilee when I was growing up here on the bay. I've seen them, uh, you know, come up on the edge of the beach and then when a ship wave comes or anything that stirs the water up and puts oxygen back in the water, if the wind changes, they go back out and they live, you know. But now I'm seeing dead eels on the beach. I'm seeing mullet up here that I've never seen before. So I think it's something besides a Jubilee. I think it's something's depleting the oxygen in the water. I'm not sure whether it's uh, nutrient pollution or what it is, but it's something different for sure. Those animals gathered at the water's edge are starving for oxygen. On those hot summer nights when the air goes still, and there are no waves stirring up the bay, the oxygen level crashes down. A combination of nutrients flushing in from upstate fuel algae growth all summer. Then as the algae dies, it sucks the oxygen from the water. No waves, no mixing, and the very water becomes deadly. And it's becoming more common in Mobile Bay every year. As early as the 1980s, realizing the Delta and Mobile Bay were in trouble, a small group of local residents began buying up huge tracts of land in an effort to protect the ecosystem. 
there was a perception because the Delta had always looked like it did and always had been the same that, hey, it's okay. We don't need to do anything to protect it up there. And then these five and 10 and 30 acre chunks all around the edge of the Delta were being developed or mismanaged or just absolutely destroyed. So we formed the Coastal Land Trust about 1986. We bought uh, our first purchase was 17,000 acres. They went from Mobile County all the way across the Delta to Baldwin County. When it comes to conservation, Alabama lags way behind the rest of the nation. The state has protected only 4% of its land, compared to 20% in Florida. A state program called Forever Wild is helping Alabama catch up in terms of protecting land. 20 years ago, Alabamians voted to begin using revenues from natural gas wells in Mobile Bay to protect land, generating hundreds of millions of dollars. Much of what Alabama has protected lies in the center of the Delta. The challenge now is to protect the most valuable parts of the system, the creeks, valleys, and wetlands surrounding the Delta, the very places most at risk, most fragile. We've done an incredible job of protecting about 100,000 acres of the Delta. That is, that is just a remarkable thing. That land came cheap, it's great. It is now public access, there's now, that is just a wonderful resource we have, it's a wonderful core. But it's the edges that were so important to the Delta. The stuff that was harder to purchase because people had good views there and they could build their houses on those areas. We have not done a, we have done a miserable job of protecting those areas and that's our great challenge. And, and, and I'll just say it for the 15th time, if we don't protect these edges, we have lost the Delta. We have lost the Delta. The few pieces on the edges of the Delta that have been protected are spectacular. The pitcher plant bogs of Splinter Hill, the Red Hills, but much work remains. E.O. Wilson leads a group of scientists and conservationists who have a new dream for Alabama. Recognizing the area surrounding the Mobile River Basin as one of the most diverse places on the planet, they want to create a new national park. It is remarkable that you have a, a wilderness area like the one we're sitting in right here, right next to Mobile where you could start, step into your car at Government Center, the heart of Mobile, and then just drive down the tunnel. 15 minutes, you're there. You're on the edge of this great wilderness. There's nothing like it anywhere else in the country. The proposed park would be home to more species of plants and animals than any other park in the country. But creating the park will be an uphill battle, and opponents are already raising alarms. Sometimes a place defies your expectations. America's Amazon is that kind of place, but it's under siege. The Delta and its rivers are suffering from thousands of little insults, and we're all guilty. It doesn't have to be like this. We can have development and still protect what we have, but we have to be smarter. It's time environmental laws were enforced here. It's time pollution standards were raised. This place is a national treasure. It's time we treat it like one. You can't take care of your environment unless you understand it. And it is that understanding that makes us want to take care of it. When we see it affects us personally, then it gets, then it, then it gets real. We're doing so many things that we have taken for granted for five, six, ten generations, you know, in this part of the world. And now we know there's just too many of us and we've either got to change the way we do things or we've got to have to change the us. And uh, I don't see us changing. Uh, I, I think we're going to have to educate people. And what, God, goodness, what better way to do it than to have them experience a place like this? Protecting something, keeping it safe, keeping it whole, keeping it healthy and alive, that lasts for generations and it's practically free. So we always have a choice. We can protect it, or we can spend the money needed later to restore it. There's a dinosaur out there called, we've got to either have a good economy or a good ecology, that they are mutually exclusive. And I just do not believe that's true. I think the better our ecology is and the better our environment is, that the better economy will follow that. Ultimately, in a place like Alabama, we will have a stable economy when we learn to, to, to explore what has always made Alabama rich 
and what will always make it richer than other states, which is this great landscape underneath it and, and, the, and, the, and the beautiful diversity of plants and animals. Because it's so important, don't destroy it. Save it. Save the parts especially that are the richest, and this is one of the richest in the United States.